Karin, welcome. Karin is the CEO of UDirect IRA, and she is actually joining us from the West Coast. Karin, welcome. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'm here. Actually, I'm in Arizona today, different A state. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and for some reason, my my silly um, uh, camera just decided not to work. But in case you want to know, um, this is me, you know, so I'm alive. We've got that going <laughs> for us. All right. There Fantastic. we go. Well, Karen, right. I am so excited to have you on here because, um, you know, we've had other um, self-directed IRA companies on here in um, but, you know, when you and I originally spoke here a couple of months ago, you were just like, you know what, there's a way for you to build a complete real estate empire within your soft directed IRA. And so, um, but before we dive into that, um, Karin, you know, just give us a little bit, you know, the 60 second background on who you are, what it is you do and how you kind of got into this arena. Yeah, yeah. So I'm the I'm the CEO and founder of UDirect IRA Services. We're coming up on our 14th anniversary. Uh, we've got just under a billion under management. So we're helping a lot of people self-direct their IRAs. And I got into this industry after uh, a long career in various aspects of real estate, like property management. For a year, I was an actual realtor. I What else did I do? I did mortgage loan servicing and loan origination for a long time. So Having that background really educated me on uh, real estate and all its different aspects so that when in 2007, I had the opportunity to join a different uh, self-directed IRA firm, I could come in and really understand the jargon and, and, and really help people. And that's what built UDirect, you know, that kind of background and comprehension of how uh, real estate works. Awesome. 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 Well, I am so excited to have your knowledge and expertise on the show here today. And as everybody knows, I think we're all having a little bit of technical difficulty. So I will try to stay on video as long as possible. Well, let's dive in because not everybody here is familiar about the differences between uh, the regular IRA investments and what it means to self-direct. So before we start diving into the rules and how to use your retirement funds to invest in real estate, let's really Let's start off with just kind of like the, the basics. Yeah, I do have a PowerPoint. I can go over some of this if you would like. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so let's see how this works. So share screen in here. And I'll be happy to go over the basics, you know, because yeah, I really think of self-directed IRAs kind of like a, a, as a game that you want to win, you know, uh, when you're investing in your retirement uh, and you just need to know the rules so that you can win. And it's it's really not that tough. Like anything that tied to the IRS, the rules can get kind of specific, but that's why we offer a 20 minute consultation to anybody who wants to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking of doing. And how does this fit into a self-directed IRA, right? So we definitely offer that. Um, just, you know, reach out to us info at udirectira.com and we'll help you. But what we don't do is we, do, we don't give you tax advice. We're not lawyers here. We're not giving you legal advice. And we're definitely not telling you what investment to invest in because it's self-directed. And so that by that definition means that you're directing your retirement and we're facilitating that kind of like escrow. You know, you buy a house and you go to escrow, you're like, I want this house. And they facilitate it from, you know, the paperwork from getting it from you don't own it till you do. <laughs> and so we help in that process. I think that's a good way to kind of describe it. Awesome. So I know a lot of people, you know, uh, might have money um, and this is, you know, kind of comes up you know, sometimes when I work with investors, they're like, I have uh, a self-directed IRA at Charles Schwab or a Fidelity. Like what's the difference between what they do and what you do? Right. Well, let's talk, I have a slide on that too. So let's talk about it. I mean, the difference right here is that a typical IRA is going to invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you know, market correlated assets. But the self-directed IRA, and by the way, it's the same, a self-directed in a typical IRA, it's the same bucket, you know, the IRS promulgated bucket. And the only difference between a typical and a self-directed is the asset class that you're allowed to invest in. All the rules for how the money comes in, the rules for how the money goes out, it's the same, whether it's a typical IRA, like with Charles Schwab, for example, or a self-directed IRA with like with you direct IRA services. So the self-directed IRA is going to let you invest in alternative assets. And so many of those alternative assets are 
correlated to real estate, but not all of them. You know, it could be um, it could be something like uh, loans, you know, private lending, secured and unsecured debt. It could be uh, precious metals. You know, could be uh, private equity, which is a lot of times tied to real estate. But anyway, there, there are all these different sorts of asset classes. You can like invest like the uber wealthy. What do they invest in? They invest in large projects, right? And now as an individual with maybe 25, 50, $100,000, you can get in and invest in the same private equity deals as the big guys. And that's one of the freedoms that self-directed IRAs gives you. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, let's, I, I, I think I skipped ahead a little bit on your presentation. So if there's anything that we want to you know, catch up on before we get into the rules, that would be fantastic. Well, I just think I would, I would say a couple of things. One is that self-directed IRAs are for retirement purposes only, right? So if you start in with that understanding, you're not going to go astray thinking that any of the proceeds are for your personal use today. You can always take the money if you want it but there can be penalties and, uh, and, and tax if you take it early, right? Or even if you take it, you know, even when you do take it like in, in, a, in, a, in a traditional, the, the purpose of this is to save for retirement. So just keep that in mind. Um, so I think that's one of the really big things to learn. Also Americans, <laughs> we just haven't saved enough. If you think, okay, gosh, how much do I need to retire? You know, I think we should all ask ourselves that question. And if, if you haven't yet, ask yourself that question, write it down. You know, like, how much do I need to retire? Hmm, I'm going to look at this. Well, here's my monthly nut. Here's my bills. And I think in retirement, I, I'll have these expenses and figure that out, what it's going to look like, and then do the math and come up with a number for yourself and then probably add, you know, a certain pad on that and start saving. I mean, uh, and that's, that's what, that, that's what self-directed IRAs help you do. And a lot of these non-correlated assets, these alternative assets, can really help you jump ahead of where a stock might take you, for example. So that's why people like this. Excellent. Well, let's dive into some of the rules then. Yeah, it, it's definitely a rule book situation. And so I'll, I will definitely love to jump into that. Um, so we'll talk about losses in a minute, uh, but the, the rules are come from the IRS and the Department of Labor, okay? And if we look at the previous slide, it, it explains that um, that the limits when the IRS created IRAs, and this is the traditional IRA, the typical IRA, and the self-directed IRA. It's only, it's really one thing. It's the IRA. They said, hey, your IRA can invest in anything except life insurance contracts and collectibles. So in an IRA bucket, you can invest in, uh, you know, in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, yeah, index funds, whatever. It just depends on um, uh, what your, you know, what your, uh, advisor allows. For example, if you go to Charles Schwab, they're not licensed to uh, to have you invest in real estate assets. So that's where the self-directed IRA world comes up. A lot of these rules, especially for the traditional and the Roth IRA, the two most common IRA types, it's written in the IRS's website. It's irs.gov and it's publication 590. And it's a great rule book, really easy to read. It just talks about you know all the rules. You don't use an IRA. You don't borrow from it, right? You can you once in a twelve month period you can take money out for sixty days, tax free and penalty free. That's only once a year for all the accounts you have combined. If you had to do that on an emergency sake, you could, but there otherwise you don't borrow from an IRA. You don't sell anything to the IRA you already own because, as you'll learn, you are disallowed to your IRA. So your IRA doesn't uh, buy assets from you. Your IRA doesn't sell assets to you. Um, the IRA isn't security for a loan. But, you know, <laughs> we've all filled out a mortgage application and you look at the 1040, that mortgage application, and you see that it wants to know, hey, how much do you have in your retirement accounts? I think it's mostly to say, do you have something that in an emergency you could liquidate or, you know, are you a saver? Just it just des describes risk, but it's not actually securing the debt. All right, so it's okay that it's on the mortgage application. But with an IRA, self-directed IRA, self-directed 401k, whatever it is, whatever you invest in is never for personal use, present or future. You know, you always have to have the intention going in that this is a retirement asset and all the proceeds that I'm intending all those proceeds to go toward my retirement. So there's this unusual rule that I haven't seen anywhere else. And that is that people can be qualified 
and people can be disqualified to the plan. An IRA is a plan, so is a 401k. So the disqualified people are up and down your family tree, like your parents, your grandparents, you and your spouse, children and grandchildren, disallowed, okay? Plus somebody who's a fiduciary, like your CPA or your attorney or maybe a realtor, disallowed, and any 50-50 business partner, disallowed party, okay? So let, we'll talk about, you know, we're, now we're talking about the players in the game, then we'll talk about the rules in a second. But the qualified people are out to the sides on your family tree. So your IRA isn't going to, for example, uh, invest in a condo and have your dad stay there, but your uncle could. How do you like that? Your IRA can't lend money to your daughter to go to college because your daughter's a disallowed person, but your IRA could lend money to your niece for her to go to college, you know, and, as, and, and because she's not, because she's allowed. So it's important to understand who are the players in the game, qualified and disqualified people, right? But the way I view it, it's all a game of keep away from prohibited transactions. And as long as you do this, and we're, we're here to guide you through that process, you'll be just fine. So when you're looking for assets, remember that neither you nor any of those disqualified people can benefit from the IRA today. Uh, there's no personal benefit, present benefit, even, um, you know, indirect benefit. <laughs> so, you know, investors are so smart and clever. So they think, well, hey, I know what I'll do. I want to get this asset. So what I'll do is I will have my IRA give the money to my LLC. My LLC will give it to my C Corp and then my C Corp will buy the asset. You know what I mean? So that you end up having personal possession all along. The IRS says, no, you can't do that. It's There's already a rule, the indirect rule can't do it. So just if you can't do it directly, you can't do it indirectly, right? Another thing is that you're not going to buy, sell, or exchange any assets between the plan and a disallowed person. So your IRA doesn't uh, buy um, a, a property from, uh, from your parents or sell a property to your kids or to yourself, all right? But this third bullet point here says that the, these disallowed people, right? Your ascendants and descendants, fiduciaries, business partners, uh, they can't provide goods, services, or facilities to the plan. And what that means is, it, say for example, you um, are with a private equity firm and you're in the C-suite, you're disallowed because you are providing, you know, you're up there a decision maker and providing services to the asset. So you're disallowed. If uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can be disallowed to the IRA. And I think, I think that that's a good way of the you know, point uh, there, but you also can't go swinging the hammers or doing the work. That's called an over contribution of sweat equity. So there are some rules. And just by listening to this podcast today, you're not going to memorize them if you've never heard this before. And again, that's why we offer a consultation. Call us, say, hey, I've got a question. We're happy to answer that. So more about the rules. Um, who are the players? You know, we know they're prohibited and or and you know allowed and disallowed people, we'll call them. But then there's you, and then there's your IRA. Your IRA is your the tool in your tool belt. You're self-directing this. It's your tool. But the IRA owns the asset. You own the IRA, IRA owns the asset. Then there's you direct IRA services. And when I founded the company in 2009, I enlisted the services of a trust company custodian to hold the funds and do the cash management and all that. So these are the players um, on the inside of the game, okay? All right. So, so, so tell me, Whitney, I believe a lot, of your, um, a lot of your listeners here today are real estate investors, is that right? Yeah, primarily they uh, real estate investors, but primarily they are um, looking to invest passively in private equity real estate. Okay, well, I'll talk about real estate and then we'll, and the same rules apply to private equity. Uh, so we'll get we'll get into both. And by, by the way, private equity is the number one asset class in self-directed IRAs. Okay, just as on the on the whole, I sit on the board of directors for the Retirement Industry Trust Association, and we try to gain as and gather as much data as we can. And what we've gathered is that private equity is number one. Okay, but if you want to buy a house, brick and mortar, right house understand that there are pros and cons because we all know when we buy real estate personally, we get to write stuff off on our taxes. And so we'll talk about this. But when you buy real estate with your IRA, 
any gain, anything that comes back in from a sale or from rent or whatever is tax free or tax deferred. Yay, that's great. There's no time limit for holding the property. Like there might be in a 1031 exchange, you know how you've got a, you've got 180 days to get this thing done. The, the clock isn't ticking on your IRA. Your IRA can buy it today and sell it tomorrow. And as far as the IRA is concerned, you're not going to get taxed. It's, it's in a tax protected bubble. The IRA can actually borrow money, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's not like a regular loan. It may not be what you think. But the best thing about using IRA dollars to buy real estate is the potential to earn a larger rate of return on your capital because you're, when, when you have proceeds, they're not diminished by tax. So say you, you grab this property, your IRA buys it, and you hold it for a while, you get rental income. Of course, you got expenses to offset that, but then you have a liquidation, a liquidity event, and here comes that money back in your IRA. Well, it's not diminished by tax. So all that money can go back out into your next deal and you compound faster. That's the magic of the self-directed IRA in real estate, okay? Now, the downside about buying real estate with an IRA is that you don't get those tax advantages. You're not going to you know, depreciate anything. There's no cost segregation in an IRA, right? You're so, and of course, you as the investor are solely responsible for all gains and losses. It's self-directed. We are not telling you what to invest in. You've made the decision. You've just come to us to facilitate this. And of course, when you're investing in a self-directed IRA, if, if, your IRA, if your asset loses value, you can't replace those losses easily because you've got, um, you know, you've got uh, caps, contribution caps. So I think what's important to say is like, why would you even use your IRA? And I think it's because if you find a really good deal and it's like, wow, I want to grab this and you don't have the personal ability to do it on your personal cash level, but you're like, wow, you left this company. I left a big 401k at this company. I can roll that over into a self-directed IRA. I can grab this asset that way. And if that's your only way to grab the asset and you see that you see the upside, you can still do it, you know, and that's really, I think, you know, why you would use an IRA for real estate. Um, so I did mention your IRA can borrow money. And, and I mentioned also that I come from the, the mortgage industry servicing and origination. So <laughs> when I found out that your IRA could borrow money, I was very surprised. Uh, but it's not when your IRA borrows money, it's not like you go to a loan officer and get a Fannie Freddie kind of loan at all. Fannie, Freddie, VA, FHA will not lend it to an IRA because there is no recourse against the IRA. So the IRA, you know, doesn't pay back the loan. Well, the lender can't come against anything, right? So you have to get a non-recourse loan, special kind of loan. It's like a commercial loan. If the IRA were to default on that loan, the only recourse is that the lender can come against the subject property. That's it. Not against you personally, not against any other assets in the IRA. So as you can imagine, there are not a lot of lenders who offer this non-recourse loan, but if you'd like, we do have a list, not that we necessarily endorse these people, but um, we do offer this as a courtesy. So we'd be happy to send you that list and just email us info at udirectira.com. We'll shoot that list over to you. But when you get one of these loans and they're underwriting it, they're going to pretty much require more skin in the game. It's not like when we buy our house and we can put 95 5% uh, in and, and have a 95% loan. It's not like that. More skin in the game, maybe 50 or 60% in the game from the IRA. And of course, each different situation is underwritten differently. Each lender will underwrite differently. And you can't personally guarantee the loan either because you are, um, you know, you are disallowed to the IRA. So you can't, you cannot personally guarantee that loan for that reason. Okay. Cause you're disallowed to the IRA. But it's good to know that these non-recourse loans are out there. It's really cool. However, <laughs> you know, the IRS in their infinite wisdom, if you want to call it that, will tax you. So let's talk about it. A lot of people go into the situation. By the way, this does apply to private equity. So a lot of times IRA investors will get into a deal and not realize that their IRA owes a tax, not an income tax, but a UBIT UDFI tax. So in private equity, what happens is you get into a deal, your IRA becomes an equity, takes an equity share, buys an equity share of that investment, that, that, uh, that, that, you know, that offering. If that offering, if that asset sponsor is taking on 
any kind of leverage, it can throw off UDFI tax to your IRA. So if, say it's a house and you've, you've leveraged it 30%, leverage 70% uh, came from your IRA, here comes a rent check. Well, in this case, 30% of that rent came from a loan, right? So that 30% that your IRA earned because of leverage is taxable. It's this UDFI tax. When your CPA goes ahead and files the 990T every year, they're going to, in that case, take depreciation and take the write-offs. And any tax that was due, your IRA would pay that tax, all right? So just know that both buying property brick and mortar or getting involved in private equity that takes on leverage, it can throw off this tax. Boy, you want to know this before you get started, right? You always want to know all the facts before you pull the trigger on an investment. And sadly, not every asset sponsor will tell you if they're taking on leverage it's self-directed. It's your responsibility. Before you invest in private equity, say, are you taking on leverage? And if they say yes, and you don't want the UDFI tax, you can say, hey, can I get into this as a debt partner? Can my IRA loan money to the deal and get in as a, as a debt partner? That's another possibility. Um, or do they have a fund that where they're not taking on leverage and they're only taking on equity partners? Maybe there's a better offering that has no debt. Okay. That, those are ways around it. Now, UBIT is a different kind of a tax, unrelated business income tax. They're, they're kind of like twin taxes, but UBIT is when your IRA actually invests in an active business, like a, you know, maybe, well, flipping. If you flip a lot of properties, that's active income. That can lead to UBIT, but also like, like a franchise. If your IRA were to invest in a franchise, it's going to throw off a tax that can almost make that not profitable. So you really want to know about that. You can read about these taxes in the IRS's website, irs.gov, it's pub 598. And you were, these um, taxes are reported on a 990T. So there you go. So now you know about it. And if you, ah, oh, I wonder if my deal has UBIT or UDFI or, you know, what's going on, you know, ask your asset sponsor and call us and we'll help you. All right. Um, so do you want me to go and, and talk about this, Whitney, the IRA owned LLC? You know, let um, yeah, we can definitely talk about that, but, you know, um, can you paint some specific examples where it might be, you know, or just draw like a, a overarching scenario where if somebody is looking at getting into, say, a private equity deal and they have funds in their retirement account and then they have funds that are personally sitting in cash, like kind of what are the the advantages, disadvantages, like what are the potential, you know, amplification of returns um, if they did invest with their IRA over than just investing in cash? Can you, do you have numbers to kind of support that claim? Well, no, because I don't think it, I don't think whether you invest with your IRA or personally, it changes the application, amplification, um, except just to say that when you invest with your IRA, it's tax deferred. So the proceeds, the proceeds that you end up earning will help you on your next deal because you can compound that that total retirement savings in, in you know nut um, by continuing to reinvest the proceeds into the next deal. Hmm. Yeah, and I've invested, you know, quite literally, like anyway under the sun, pretty much with like my IRA accounts, and um, you know. For me, I've always prioritized, like if I have some, you know, cash sitting around that needs to be deployed, I will largely, and this is not financial advice guys, but the way I look at it is that I'll deploy the cash because I can now take the depreciate, you know, depreciative losses and use those to offset the income, you know, and continue to build that way. But, you know, for times, you know, uh, where I have like IRA money sitting aside, I'm kind of like doing what you just said, you know, you know, partnering with my CPA to model out, is it better if I go into a private equity investment where I can maybe make like a 20, 22, 25% internal rate of return? Or is it, you know, knowing that I've got to deal with UDFI and UBIT on some sort of level versus like going into like a note investment that might only yield eight or 10%, but I can compound that because I'm not paying the taxes on it, right? That, so, that's so true, you know, and, and a lot of times too, like, like you've got maybe, I think also when you find the deal and your personal idle cash is deployed in other deals, you know, but you want to take down a deal and you've got the money. And also too, if you want to have that tax protected money for retirement, um, you know, both are great reasons to use the IRA. So 
there's it, but but you've done the wise thing, of course, and that is to talk to your tax advisor and to yeah. get their opinion on on what they see. And, and when you're doing that, when you're really examining a deal before you get into it, your opportunity to have a negative experience, like getting it with a bad operator or something like that, or having some fraud, it decreases the more due diligence you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess like, I was just, you know, assuming that you've done all the due diligence on the operator, the market, and the deal, you know, now you're getting down to deciding what bucket of money are you going to use? You know, really yeah. it's not the operator that's going to be able to answer that question for you. It's your, your own personal investment team, you know, primarily that CPA accountant, that's going to be able to look at your personal situation and yeah. ask the right questions to help you decide, right. okay, you know, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? And like, what are the implications potentially like whenever the deal exits? Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. Like how close are you to retirement, to your retirement age? You know, do you have a long window or a short window? And do you want the money to pay your personal bills to the proceeds? Or do you want to save that for long-term? Yeah. There's so many different questions to ask. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the checkbook IRA. Cause I know pe people get these a little bit confused and, um, you know, that they're just kind of like willy nilly that, you know, if they do a checkbook IRA, now they don't have to report anything to, <laughs> to their custodian, which is simply not true. So let's demystify this a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's a whole bunch not true. And I'll tell you right now, the IRS hasn't started auditing, but when they do, this is where they're going to start. They're going to, because a few years ago, the IRS made it so that if you have an IRA owned LLC, we use a special code and we report that to the IRS. So for probably at least six or seven years, they've we've reported, and every self-directed IRA company has reported to the IRS whether or not your IRA contains this asset. So they can really, this is the low-hanging fruit. So if you're going to use this tool, um, the first thing you want to do is keep excellent, excellent records. You know, use QuickBooks or whatever you use. Um, and so that you've got really clear books that show that the money was only used for retirement purposes. Your only use of the money was to invest and pay for expenses of the asset that the LLC owns and nothing else, because then you could be subject to a prohibited transaction. We didn't even talk about that. I, I neglected to mention that if your IRA is found to commit a prohibited transaction, it's, and, and I've been in this business, what, almost, you know, 15, 17 years, bunch, bunch of years. I've only seen a handful of actual prohibited transactions, so don't be too scared, but but you don't want to be that person, <laughs> you know, um, because if you actually commit a prohibited transaction, it's game over for your whole IRA. The bubble of tax protection bursts. You owe tax on the entire IRA, not just the asset that, that you know, where the prohibited transaction occurred, excise taxes and regular income tax going back to the date of the, of the infraction. So it can be really painful. You don't want to do that. Again, that's why you call us, talk to us. We'll, 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 you know, guide you along the way, answer all your questions. But with a checkbook IRA, it's a tool you can use. Um, there is, if you if you look in the IRS's website or Internal Revenue Code, nothing says checkbook IRA. Okay, this all started in 1996. There was a case Swanson v. Commissioner that started this, and that's so. This came from case law, not from the IRS. So here's how it works: Your IRA, your self-directed IRA, is open has money in it, you hire a third party to create a special purpose LLC. Now your IRA can't invest in an LLC that you have created yourself because you are a disallowed person, right? So your IRA, it, it's a prohibited transaction to do that. But if your IRA, if you have a third party create the LLC in the name of the IRA, that's fine. So now we get a copy of the member ledger and, and a direction of investment form, and we'll disperse money from the IRA account into the checking account of the LLC. And now you've got control over your retirement money, but this LLC absolutely must follow the same rules for IRA investing as your IRA account does. And yes, you definitely do report this to the IRS and here's how you do it. Every year we ask uh, self-directed IRA uh, customers, investors, to give us the valuation of their assets. The LLC is an, is an asset in your account. So we'll say, what's the value? And you'll tell us and we'll report that to the IRS. So the IRA is the umbrella. The LLC is an asset under the umbrella of the IRA. It's an asset of the IRA. 
So you're definitely reporting it. And don't think, don't even think about playing fast and loose with this if you don't want the risk, mm -hmm. but you can sure use it. You know, you sure can use it. Yeah, before we move off on that, because I know we have like several, you know, investors that like to, uh, that are interested in that kind of checkbook, you know, scenario, or, or they have questions on like, why would I do it this way as opposed to just investing directly in my IRA? And, you know, I, I can speak for me personally, like when I, I, I opened up a checkbook LLC, one, to have that additional layer of control, right? Because the IRA owns the LLC and then I'm managing the money that's in when the LLC account. And so it, it allows me to be more nimble, um, you know, and, and move faster with my investments. But at the, like just what you said, Karin, like at the end of the year, it doesn't relinquish me from doing any, you know, I have to do just as much reporting, even just slightly more in trade for that flexibility, because now I'm, instead of you, instead of the custodian doing all the bookkeeping, I'm doing all the bookkeeping. It has to be above board. There was a case, um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, Karen. Like, I, I believe yeah. it was December 2021, Minolte versus Commissioner. And, you know, I, I remember the, the whole world on the street for like six weeks, eight weeks was checkbook and LLCs were no longer allowed, you know, shut them down. The IRS is coming for them, you know, and really, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, we're, we're the, 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 the owner of the IRA went awry is that they bought assets with the checkbook LLC money, but instead of putting them in the name of the LLC and having them custodied put in, um, you know, it was gold coins, I believe, and put in a vault under the LLC, they took possession of them in their own name and had them at home. Yeah, uh, what you're saying is, is like amalgamation of several different things that happened at that time. Um, one of the things that happened was at the end of 2021, there was the Build Back Better Act. And th that was, it was really going to threaten uh, private equity investing in general, and including the IRA owned LLC, it would have it would have completely disallowed IRA owned LLCs. Fortunately, Manchin voted against it, you know, the last that like the last ditch effort and, and it all and it died, thankfully, because it would have diminished the self-directed IRA industry by at least 50%. But that didn't pass. And that was at the end of 2021. And then you talk about the gold at home issue. Now that's for you know, I mentioned Rita, you know, our the group that that you know, our industry group for a long time. We've been talking to the IRS about the gold at home issue. Wow. Gold at home is having personal possession of your assets, but there were TV commercials with this guy and he's sitting in a, in it, like this easy chair with his faithful dog next to him and his stack of gold on the other side saying that he had his IRA money in his house. No, 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 no. Prohibited transaction. You don't see those ads anymore. That's when there was the, uh, the case law about not being the gold at home case law. So these are different um, things actually. But, but you're right, there's no such thing as gold at home. It has to be custodied. So at UDirect IRA Services, we definitely allow and can help you with in gold investing, precious metals investing, and that those metals are stored in a facility and, and it's, it's all done correctly. But you, <laughs> you, know, you can't have personal possession of your IRA owned assets. It's a prohibited transaction. Does that cover it? Oh yeah, no, 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 yeah. Sorry, I thought you were moving on to, to the different types of accounts there. Oh, I'd be happy to, if you'd like me to, I'd love to do that. Okay, yeah. here we go. Yeah, so so we call it a self-directed IRA, um, and but it's a lot of things, right? It, it could also be like a health savings account, an HSA. So where you're working, if you have a high deductible health plan, you can, you can self-direct that. You, you have to sign up for the HDHP plan, and then you can have a self-directed plan. The Coverdell, which is a, a, also called a, an, a uh, what is it called? It's called, a, uh, anyway, the Coverdell is a, a, a savings account for kids to go to college, and you can only contribute 2000 a year. We don't offer those because they're just it's just so small. The health savings account can be larger. Uh, we also where you, you're not going to self-direct uh, one of the four plans, the 401k, 457, 403b. Defined benefits are self-directable by themselves and so are profit sharings. But the individual K, the solo K, which is sometimes wrongly called an EQRP, that's just something someone made up. 
an individual a 401k for individual business owners is what it is, and that can be self-directed, as well as all these other types, you know, the traditional Roth, SEP simple, spousal inherited IRA. So the self-directed world really can, is able to encompass what you're looking at here. It's really an umbrella term. And the way you do it is pretty straightforward. Open, fund, invest. You open an account. You know, on our website, we have a big gold badge. You just open that account. Um, then you fund your account. Uh, and you can do that by making a contribution. And that depends upon your age and your account type and your income. You can do an IRA to IRA transfer, or you can roll over a previous employer plan. So you now your account's open and it's got money. Now you tell us what you'd like to invest in, provide the supporting documentation, the contracts. We review it, fund it, and then you self-directed. 100% of the proceeds due to the IRA have to go back to that IRA that owns the assets. And if there are any expenses um, regarding that asset, they must be paid for by the IRA. Like in private equity now, a lot of these um, operators have uh, taken on debt or they have, you know, renewing debt. Like maybe they had a, an adjustable loan that's renewing now. And so they have to take on debt at a higher rate. So what we're seeing right now is a lot of capital calls in private equity and private debt. And so you need to have the money in your self-directed IRA to cover that capital call because you can't pay it personally. That would be prohibited. Um, you can, you know, you can contribute. You can um, move money from another plan. Uh, to, in order to do that, but you always want to leave a pad in case there are expenses. But that's basically how you self-direct. It, it's very easy to do this. The the difficult thing is, or the, I'd say where you really want to put your 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 you know your brain cells is in choosing the right deal, investigating that right deal, make sure it's right for you, and checking out the asset sponsor for their uh, credibility and you know just you know get the word on the street about how they perform. But that's how it is. Open fund invest. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so Karen, I guess I have a question just in the efforts of time and thank you for putting your contact information up there. I would love for you for those people who are just listening in, you know, recap how they can get a hold of you. Um, but once you do that, like what's new in the retirement savings world? Like, you know, uh, several people here might already have their SDI area open. Is there any news that we should be aware of? Yeah, there is. Um, the SECURE Act, we had SECURE Act 1.0 at the end of 2019. And what that did that really impact, the greatest impact to retirement accounts is it increased the RMDH, which we haven't even talked about, required minimum distributions. It used to be that once you reached the age of 70 and a half, you had to pull the money out of your uh, pre-tax accounts. But then SECURE Act 1.0 in 2019 changed that to the age of 72, Secure Act 2.0, which passed on December 31st of 2022, that increased the age to uh, to 73, and in 10 years, so in the year you know 2033, you um, you will be able to uh, save yourself from RMDs until the age of 75. I think the government is just seeing and acknowledging, you know, we live longer, and we're going to need that money longer. So it's so making it taxable early isn't to the advantage of the saver. So that's probably one of the biggest things that came out of Secure Act 2.0. But another thing, um, and here it is July, there's still no, uh, you know, no detail on it, but Secure Act 2.0 says that a SEP IRA and a simple IRA can accept Roth contributions. That's a mind blower. If you're self-employed and say you have a SEP IRA, a SEP stands for Savings or Simplified Employee Pension. You can the max you can contribute to a SEP is sixty six thousand dollars for the year twenty twenty three. So if you could contribute sixty six thousand dollars as Roth money and have it grow tax free, that's great. But the department so now that's the law according to Secure Act two point that passed and Biden signed. But there is no guidance for it. How you know how much is can be Roth one hundred percent or or fifty percent. And what, you know, what are the rules for this? So we're, we're in fact, just before this call, um, I was on a, a conference call with, with some of our um, industry lobbyists that said, we still don't have any notification from the Department of Treasury uh, giving us any detail about the SEP, the Roth SEP and the Roth Simple. But that is something that's coming up. So definitely, you know, keep that, you know, on the back burner if you're looking to invest, you know, more, more dollars more Roth dollars. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, Karen, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for our Q&A session. How can, if people want to learn more about you direct, how can they uh, reach out to you and get in contact with you? Well, first off, we're all over social media, so you can find us anywhere, you know, and you can Google us and all that. But our website is udirectira.com. We have so much information there. You can email me um, at khall at udirectira.com, whatever you want. We, we're, you can get us by phone. <laughs> you know, there's like 20,000 ways to get a hold of people now, right? Like messages on LinkedIn. You know, there's so many different ways. But I think email is the best. And even just a plain info at udirectira.com will get the quickest response. Awesome. 